Welcome in, everybody, to the flagship podcast. I am Chip Brown of Horns247.com, joined by my teammate, my partner in crime at Horns247.com, the one and only Eric Henry. Eric, fresh back from Charlotte, North Carolina, where the Texas Longhorns basketball team did not get out of the first weekend of the tournament. Although it was close, they beat Colorado State, looked good, handled their business. Although we were seeing some little cracks in the foundation because we weren't getting the scoring from Dylan DeZu and Max A. Smith that Texas had been getting. And then they run into Rick Barnes and the Tennessee Volunteers in a kind of unwatchable game from a baskets being made standpoint, but it was a one point game with 34 seconds left. Um, and Texas just couldn't get it done. Uh, Max Acemas, Dylan DeZu combined to go seven of 28 shooting in that game. That was tough. That's 25% shooting. If you're keeping it home, um, both, both guys struggled in the NCAA tournament, um, but Texas women are in the Sweet 16. We will talk about that. They're taking on Gonzaga out in Portland. I don't like that because that's kind of a home game uh, for the Gonzaga Bulldogs, um, but we'll get to that. And spring football continues we are four practices in on spring football for the texas longhorns of course spring game april 20th eric we um had a chance to to take in some spring football let's start there we'll get to basketball um but spring football i mean a lot of moving parts for this football team steve sarkeesian sounds like he's Feeling good about the depth of his team. He likes the team's length, likes their speed, but he's looking for thermostats, not thermometers, Eric. Chip Brown. Oh, man, it's great to be back from Charlotte. We talk all the things we got going on on the 40 acres. Men's hoops, all short. Women's hoops, pushing on. Spring football, and I guess if oh, I forgot to mention start, Kevin Durant was in the house for the Texas women. That was pretty cool. You, you, you were there in the house covering the game, and I think uh, we're going to start with a little spring ball. Chip, I, before I launch kind of into you know what my observations were from day four, practice four, taking place, DKR, Texas Memorial Stadium, the Mecca, some folks would say, college football. I'm just throwing it out there, and I'm only one man. I'm not making any assertions. Um, Chip, I, this is a genuine question. Does Steve Sarkeesian, does he look any more relaxed in, in, in this spring than he has in previous springs? Because I think that was the tone that I feel like I've gathered from day one and especially day four of spring ball. He is just at ease. Um, and I think there's good reason to feel at ease going back to day one when I asked him about just the death uh, across the board. And he talked about, you know, the sheer numbers of players on this team and not only that but from a position to position perspective feeling as if this team is as deep as it has been in the four years you've been here so i just want to ask you really quick before i kind of you know um jump into some thoughts on on day four does he feel any more relaxed than maybe he has in previous springs from, from your i think eyes? so i think so he feels um you know they set the the target last year they hit the target so that's a that's a a confidence builder, I think, for Steve Sarkeesian as a head coach, um, because he had not done that in his previous stints at Washington and USC. He hadn't won a conference championship. And so there was, you know, the naysayers would say, well, wow, Steve Sarkeesian, what's he done? Well, now he's won a conference championship and he's been to the college football playoff and he's recruiting his you know what off so yeah i think he does seem uh to feel like he's 
in charge and confident and um I don't want to I don't know if relaxed is the word because as a head football coach I don't know if you're ever sure. relaxed but sure. I think he's confident in feeling like things are moving in the right direction that that, that that's fair yeah and relax maybe at ease you know uh, maybe not relaxed but confident right I mean that that just really stuck out to yeah. me I spent uh the fourth practice look at the running backs chip and you know it, it's interesting this time last year I wasn't here at the moment, but I can speak as to fall football, right? Big 12 media days was my first assignment here, 24 seven sports. And one of the major questions was the running back spot. Who's going to replace B. John Robinson, right? Is it going to be running back by committee? Is it going to be a bell cow? And then Steve Sarkeesian said, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out. Whether it's going to be a running back by committee or just one guy. It, it ended up working itself out pretty darn good for the horns in the form of Jonathan Brooks, who, you know, certainly was for his injury in the running, maybe a dark horse Heisman candidate, but certainly a Doak Walker award uh candidate there before his injury and now you got to feel pretty good you lose jb but you have last year's uh season opening back in cj baxter and season ending back cj baxter and i think Jaden blue right we've talked about it a ton but you got to feel good about his upside but chip <laughs> I, I, once upon a time you know a much lower level of football than this but you know i was a 17 18 year old freshman in parking on spring camp Jacksonville University, I can tell you right now, I didn't look like Christian Clark and Jared Gibson. Those guys look like grown men. And I wrote about it. The, the big takeaway was just the depth of that room. I, I think you got to feel that's something that, and, and we've talked about it in our last episode, right? You know, in terms of, or maybe it was two episodes ago, I can't remember which, but where do you feel, you know, in terms of the compass level offense, defense? You take a look at that running back room. And despite the fact that you lose A.D. Mitchell, you lose Jordan Whittington, you lose Xavier Worthy, J.T. Sanders. I don't know about you, man, but I feel confident in that running back room paired with uh, pretty much a turning slew of offensive linemen from last year's group. I, I think that paired with Quinn yours and then the talent of, of this receiver room, it, it just makes for, you know, real optimism in terms of that offensive unit. But, yeah, man, that, that running back room, D.J. Baxter looks thicker, his lower half. Steve Sarkeesian talked about the progression of year one to year two in terms of running back. The thing is now, of course, working in pass pro, knowing what to do as far in terms of um, pass protection, in terms of uh, knowing what to do as opposed to guessing, but also making that progression as far as breaking tackles, staying upright, you know, running violently. We all see CJ back. So 6'1, 218 pounds, certainly got the frame to do it right. But, you know, then it's becoming that guy who's like Jonathan Brooks, who's like B. John Robinson, who's like Roshan Johnson in terms of forcing missed tackles at this level. You got to be able to make a guy miss and get to the second level of defense. And then you pair that with a Jaden Blue. I, I mean, even a Trey Weisner, right, who impressed last year on special teams. So, yeah, that was my big takeaway from uh, the fourth practice, which just looking at this running back room and thinking, okay, you know, regardless of – Chip, uh, last year, the season opened, excuse me, against Rice, and, you know, it was a little bit of a feeling out process. We saw things take off against Alabama, a little bit of feeling out process against Wyoming. For whatever reason, I think, and of course, you know, this year's schedule, obviously, uh, in the non-conference has Michigan in it, right, but not the same Michigan team as last year. I think, Chip, in my mind, if – and we're still a long ways away from August, but if for whatever reason there's a feeling out process with an Amari Nyblatt or uh, Matthew Golden, Silas Bolden, Isaiah Bond, I feel confident in the fact that this offense can stay on schedule by just turning around, handing it to a sophomore CJ Baxter and a junior Jaden Blue, giving him 25, 30 carries and saying, hey, go go do your thing and, and, and we're going to be all right. So that's my big yeah. takeaway early on. They might have won a national championship if they had just – kept handing it off to to uh Jaden Blue and and CJ Baxter the way that they started that Sugar Bowl game um you know first quarter averaging 12 yards a carry it's pretty good um Michigan just kept running it and they ran for 300 yards in a national championship so yeah I agree with you Eric um I look at this running back room and um I'm a big fan of Jaden Blue. I mean, I just think he's come a long way. Remember, this is a guy who chose not to play his 
uh, senior year in high school. And then he had second thoughts and the coach of his high school team left it up to a vote of the team. They said no. Um, so he came to Texas with some questions about, is he a good teammate? Blah, blah, blah. All we've heard about Jaden Blue is he's maturing. He's he t- he's accountable. He's putting in the work. Um, I was sold when Tashard Choice compared him to Jameer Gibbs at the Sugar Bowl. Um, I was, you know, me being a Lions fan, and uh, I, w- I wasn't even that sold on Jameer Gibbs until later in the season. Uh, I was kind of hoping they'd take Jalen Carter from Georgia. But anyway, um, I just think Jaden Blue is really – and he's draft eligible after this year. I think he's kind of the veteran in the room now, even though CJ Baxter was the starter to start the 2023 season, a a decision. I'm still not hundred percent sure who and why that was made um, because of just how productive Jonathan Brooks had been not only in high school at Hallettsville, but also when he got into games for Texas and then he immediately showed that he's got that contact balance and ability to force missed tackles, which is the next step for both Jaden Blue and uh, C.J. Baxter. And I felt like Sarkeesian was kind of talking it into existence after the fourth practice this week when he said, you know, C.J. Baxter is at his best when he runs violently. Because we saw him run violently toward the end of the year. We didn't see it at all times during the year. So, um, and look, got to cut it loose. Got to got to be ready for, you know, the uh, the contact and and to and to fight through it. So, I think, and I'm glad you mentioned Trey Wisner because Trey Wisner, from what I'm hearing. All he does is run violently. So watch out for Trey Wisner because, um, you know, he's not the, he is definitely the un, unsung guy in that room. We know Savion Red came in a little heavy. Uh, we know that Christian Clark and Jarek Gibson are really uh, guys to watch because the Shard Choice is compared Jared Gibson to Roshan Johnson and Christian Clark to Bijan Robinson. So with those kind of comparisons, and I trust to shard choice, that guy's done nothing, but re- he recruited Jameer Gibbs to Georgia tech before he got, uh, you know, transferred off to Alabama to shard choice knows what he's looking at. He knows what he's recruiting. Um, yeah, there's, I think a lot of confidence that Texas fans should have in that in that running back room. And honestly, the running back room to me is a little more proven than the receiver room because members Sarkeesian, he wants his receivers to know the whole offense, the concepts so that you're not just running plays, you know, where you fit and why you fit that way and why you have to do everything uh, to the, to the T to the detail. And those guys are, proving themselves right now to the Texas coaches, Isaiah Bond, Matt Golden, John T. Cook, DeAndre Moore, Ryan Wingo, on and on. It's a talented room, but we got to see who can master all the, all the details of what Steve Sarkeesian wants. But I do, I think he feels good about the leadership, Eric. And that's, that's important because you lost some big time dudes, um, and from a leadership standpoint, I mean, from Jalen Ford and Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy and even Jaron Thompson in the in the secondary, Ryan Watts, you got to have the new voices emerge, and the team has to acknowledge and accept those voices. So, uh, but it does feel like Steve Sarkeesian, who said. You know, look, thermostats, they set the temperature. Thermometers just read the temperature. We need thermostats. I think he he mentioned uh, Alfred Collins, Vernon, well, Alfred Collins, Baron Sorrell, Ethan Burke. And I thought, you know, I mean, they feel really good about Anthony Hill. 
wherever he plays. And, and so, you know, some of that leadership is emerging. Malik Muhammad is another guy we've heard as a, an emerging leader on the defensive side. So, um, and Trey Moore, what did you think of Steve Sarkeesian's kind of extended comments about Trey Moore, the UTSA? Uh, he's a junior at Texas, uh, transfer at the edge position. Yeah, Chip, I mean, I don't think the praise didn't surprise me because obviously I saw Trey Moore play for, you know, a season, uh, his first full season as a starter uh, at UTSA before I took the job here. Didn't see him last year as extensively, but knew he's a player. Uh, I guess, again, I honestly want to say I wasn't surprised because you never know, Chip. I mean, listen, as someone who covered G5 football for five years, and I guess – Three of those were in the transfer portal. Really, two were in the transfer portal era, the prime transfer portal era. Chip, I've seen so many kids who transfer from your Western Kentuckys and your FIUs and your UTSAs and your UAPs up to the you know Power Five level. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't, right? So I think you, you can never say it's going to be a sure thing that a kid transfers to the Power Five level and suddenly hitting the ground running, but. With Trey Moore and, and, you know, for viewers and listeners, I am working on an extended piece on Trey Moore, reaching out to some of the offensive line coaches uh, of the American Athletic Conference and CUSA just to kind of get their background on Trey Moore. But I had a front row seat, Chip, his first game that he broke out, two and a half sacks against FIU. Now, quite frankly, just being transparent, that FIU offensive line is certainly not a measuring stick that I would use in comparison to the SEC. You know, that was an, an FIU offensive line that was in flux all year, even for the group of five level. But with well, that and that's, said, been the, that's been the question on Trey Moore is that the 14 and a half sacks he had last year, a lot of them were piled up against the tomato cans on on the UTSA schedule. Yeah, he had, if memory serves me correct, he had three and a half against UAB, which that one – um, I, I will put some stock in that UAB has been uh, one of the more you know, solid programs in the group of five for a while. I want to say he had two against FAU, if memory serves me correct. Of course, Tom Herman and company, that was one, uh, one again that, you know, teams that said their record wasn't great, but at least a measure of stability. I'm just here to tell you, as someone who covered FIU, I mean, that offensive line was Chip, they, they, they were taking guys from, you know, BMI in the Citadel, right? It, it put them on the offensive line. So not quite, uh, you know, Georgia's of the world, right? But nevertheless, um, and I think I said this to you, what was stood out to me, the athleticism and the spin move, that 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 um, Dwight Freeney-esque kind of spin move. I, I don't want to you know, compare him to, you know, an all pro, but it, it, at least at that level, those were the things that stood out to me. So to your question, what I think of that, you know, I think it's great, right, that he's at least making an impact on this staff and with the head man immediately um, with his work ethic, right? Because I think everything else will come. Um, I think him being in the weight program with Tory Becton will come. I think I said this on last pro last podcast, UTSA um, fought for years to get, you know, a, a truly division one strength uh, facility there for all their programs. I think they call it their their um, race facility. Um, they just got to, you know, I think Trey Moore only spent one year in that facility, right? So him having, you know, what will be at his disposal at UT, that will certainly help him. But listen, if we're just talking about stockpiling talent and having guys, I don't know about you, Chip, but if it, it, listen, Baron Sorrell, Ethan Burke are going to be your guys, right? You know, for a fact. And we're going to see where guys like, you know, Colton Vosick and, and, and others, um, you know, Jamon Tapp, you know, guys that where they kind of fit. But if you're just telling me, based on what I saw at the group of five level, if you're selling uh, a guy like Trey Moore, hey, let's take our time with him. Give him a role as a pass rusher alongside a, a Anthony Hill or, you know, maybe even a Colin Simmons. As, as guy, we'll see where that plays out. Trey Moore can do that in, in my mind. You know, if we're not asking him to play, 50 something snaps against division one, or I shouldn't say division one, you know, power five SEC level uh tackles per game. But situationally, like a Chris Ross was, like a like a Jet Bush was, he can do that in my mind. So that's encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. And Colin Simmons continue to hear good things about him and what's not to like. Anyone who's watched his film out of out of Duncanville knows that kid's got bend. He's got uh the ability to to carry weight. Um 
dip under offensive tackles, shoulders, and and get to the quarterback. And usually when you have that uh, at the 6A level in Texas high school football over and over and over again, you can get it to translate. He was a five-star for a reason, and we've not heard anything to diminish that. So that's a impressive room. Um, it's the, the, you know, you mentioned all the names. I mean, it's, it's a battle. So, uh, justice Finkley in there. I mean, <clears throat> so that's going to be something, I, another name, another veteran transfer who got mentioned from Steve Sarkeesian with some effort. Well, I mean, he brought up Andrew Makuba as a guy who's wired, right. Who, um, is a good teammate, a leader, a guy he's really excited about who can play both the slot corner and the safety position. Um, we saw his feet. He's got good feet. He, I think he's going to be a really good coverage safety or if, if he's playing the slot corner, um, I think he's going to be a better coverage safety than what Texas has had. We'll see. Uh, Jaron Thompson's at Auburn now. But, um, yeah, I, I think you're – feeling good about the fact that those guys are are getting mentioned um, as transfers. I don't, we asked Sarkeesian about Jalen Catalan last year, but it was never as sort of, uh, I don't think the comments were as deep or heartfelt uh, from Sarkeesian at any point about Jalen Catalan than what we've heard from Steve Sarkeesian so far about Trey Moore and Andrew Makuba. So I think they feel really good about uh, what they're seeing from those guys after winter conditioning through for spring practices. And obviously there's tape of those guys playing. One question I wanted to get into Eric was the, uh, the command of the quarterbacks. Steve Sarkeesian talked about the command the Quinn Ewers and Arch Manning, because they're the guys who've been in the program, know the players on this team. Uh, Trey Owens, early enrollee, head swimming, learning everything. But the command that Quinn Ewers and Arch Manning have to have, I thought when Steve Sarkeesian said that, because those quarterbacks are now having to help bring along these receivers who are new to the Texas offense or are new to getting more reps or, or vying for a potential starting role. If you're a Jonte cook or a Deandre Moore, or Ryan Niblett. Um, I think that's the next layer for Quinn Ewers and Arch Manning, you know, Quinn had to be accountable to himself last year. It was this time last year that he apologized to Texas fans for not coming through in his first year in 2022, which I thought was amazing. Like, wow, you don't have to put that on yourself. I mean, just go grind, but he did. And then he answered the bell, led his team to a, a conference championship. Um, but now he's got to bring along receivers, Eric. And um, it sounds like he's up to the task. Chip, I, I don't think that's something that we can understand. I think it's one of those things that we kind of gloss over when we talk about quarterback play and quarterbacks in general, right, Chip? It's one thing to go in there and call the plays. It's one thing to go out there and, you know, be the quarterback. It's another thing to have command of the offense to, you know, call the protections, shift protections, put guys in the right place. And more importantly, or maybe most importantly, Chip, when – those guys look at you in the huddle. They, they're like, all right, it's time to shut up. That's that, that's who's doing it, right? Those things matter. And, and again, I think maybe we kind of gloss over that. I'll speak in, in specificity with Arch here because with Quinn, obviously he kind of spoke about it last year. And Steve Sarkis kind of spoke about it last year, feeling more confident in being, you know, his guys, his team, uh, and, and, and being emboldened, right? When you're named the starter, what comes with that? as opposed to going to it with a quarterback competition. But with Arch, I mean, it's it, it's so easy to forget. We're talking about, you know, all-world, five-star recruit, the whole nine. But 
he's a, it was a freshman like everyone else, right? He's trying to get his feet wet. He's trying to get adjusted to college and whatnot. And, and, and trying to find his ID, trying to find his ID, right? All those things. Now, you know, out the window, right? Seemingly he's walking in there and like, all right, he's, he's keeping pace. He's seen what it's supposed to look like with Quinn York and certainly, you know, has his family lineage. You can lean on as well as far as knowing what it's supposed to look like. But Chip, those things matter. They, I truly believe they do. I, I've heard, you know, you gave the excellent line that you said Barry Switzer said, you know, about, you know, hey, who's got the best quarterbacks going to win the game? And I've heard it, you know, from even my time around guys like Butch Davis and, and you know, other other um, G5 coaches at the time who, who've had success. I mean, even, you know, a guy like Trent Gilford when he was, you know, getting the, the job there at UAB. It's like there's a difference between going in there and having a guy who's just calling the plays and, and, and is listening, you know, kind of regurgitating what the coach is telling him versus being in command. I mean, Chip, we can liken that to even our jobs, right? There's a difference between you go through and, and you're kind of feeling out <laughs> the job uh, versus you know what to do and you feel confident about it and you're executing, right? So don't think that's a small thing you can just gloss over here. And, you know, now year three uh, for Quinn and, and I guess year this is what Quinn's fourth year of college football. Man, that's, yeah. Damn, yeah. And man, another like, name. Like, I think. Well, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I just was going to say, man, four years of Quinn. It's like yesterday he was the kid enrolling in Ohio state. So right, they're just going to finish that. Yeah. Talk. Go ahead, Chip. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, you know, one of the other names I think Texas fans are curious about is Cam Williams, who's vying to take over at right tackle for Christian Jones, who is uh, getting ready for the NFL draft next month. And um, Steve Sarkeesian pointed out that Cam's done a good job with his weight and his movement, um, even at 6'5", 360, which is what he's listed at. Remember, he was at one point 374, and he's got it down to 360. Um, Steve Sarkeesian's quote was, Cam's done a great job. You know, his weight has really come down. I referenced it to him today on the field. He's moving really well. Cam has really matured that way in the value of keeping his weight manageable to where he can play to the best of his ability. And he talked about the 76 snaps that he got in the start against Kansas state. Um, so Cam Williams is definitely uh, a player to watch this spring as he tries to move in uh, to replace Christian Jones on the offensive line. Um, your thoughts. It's interesting. Uh, Chip, but first off, you know, agree with everything you said there, as far as, kind of, you know, where you feel at this point with, with Cam Williams. Um, I guess, Chip, and I, and I hate to do it in the form of a question, but the offensive line in my mind, at least in my experience, is, is only as good as your weakest link. Um, and in this case, I do wonder, listen, all the talent in the world, you know, it, it certainly has the potential to be that guy. I guess I just wonder, um, and I don't know if you feel the same way, if you saw any glimpses uh, of anything just, you know, from previous to, to now that, that give you um, confidence. And this is why, where I'm going with this, Chip, is, you know, Christian Jones is someone who you can speak to better than I certainly took a little while to put it all together, right? But once he did, you knew you had a stalwart, you know, there at, at Tackle. Um, and I guess I just wonder, I mean, I'm not trying not to make a mountain out of a molehill, but when you know you have veterans, Jake Majors, you know, Kelvin Banks, you know, Aiden Connor, the list goes on. But an offensive line is only as strong as, as their weakest link. So I, I guess, you know, maybe if we revisit this conversation this time and come fall, I'd be really interested to see what the conversation is there. Because if that's a, listen, solidified, lock, we know we're going, then, then you feel great. If that conversation's iffy, you get a different feeling, Chip. And maybe that's just me. I don't know what your thoughts. No, it's true. And I think the different feeling is <clears throat> if Cam Williams is not as consistent as they were hoping, as the coaches were hoping, then, you know, we've talked about it. And Kyle Flood mentioned it at the Sugar Bowl that Hayden Connor could move over to right tackle and, and Neto Yumazulu could move in um, or Cole Hudson at 
left guard where Hayden Connor um, has lined up the last couple of years. So that's that's a real thing. And that's something that that we need to continue to watch because, um, you know, I thought it was interesting, too, that DJ Campbell right at the beginning of practice yesterday was the one called into the center of the entire team to lead them in their stretching. And um, that's that's an honor the coaches bestow to a player. And I think that's a good sign because DJ Campbell's a guy whose confidence seemed to go up as the as the year went on last year. And now he's I mean, he was the number one interior offensive line recruit in the country. Uh, the same year that Calvin Banks was the number one offensive tackle recruit in the country. And they were in the same class with Cam Williams and Cole Hudson and Connor Robertson. So um, it was a talented offensive line group. And now they're taking over as the uh, dominant, you know, men of action on that offensive line and voices. So uh, that's definitely a storyline to watch as we advance. All right. Eric, um, anything else on football you feel we need to touch before we uh, kind of wrap up men's basketball and give some love to the the women's basketball team? No, let's let's dive into it. There's certainly a lot to get to between both teams. Yeah, and you were in Charlotte, and um, great coverage there from you as the uh, Longhorns uh, handled Colorado State, and then just uh, couldn't quite come up with the answers when they had to have them. I mean, again, defensively, you love what Texas was able to do to Tennessee in that game. Um, again, a one-point game with 34 seconds left. It just didn't come together. Tough tough night. You know, just really you feel for Dylan Dezu and Max Acemus because they played so well all year and they clearly did not finish the way they wanted to finish um, the season. If you look at both of their numbers um, down the stretch, you had uh, Dylan Dezu was 11 of 44 shooting in his last three games against the loss to K-State in the Big 12 tournament. He was... Um, what four of 18 um yeah it just tw what 11 of 44 25 percent shooting in the last three games and two of 15 from three point range which is um you know he was averaging over 50 percent from three point range for most of the season and then a smith goes uh eight of 25 shooting that's 32 percent six of 22 from three, uh, which is 27% in his last two games against Colorado State and uh, Tennessee. And look, those opposing teams are trying to take those guys away, but I thought Dylan DeZue had a lot of good looks that just didn't go down for him in the Tennessee game, Eric. Chip, unfortunately, and I wrote this, the story – of the Tennessee game. It should be, man. It, the story of the Tennessee game should be the fact that this team, after Rodney Terry preached over and over and over again, wanting his teams to be defensive led and everything, starting with their defense and not letting their defense affect their offense. And how many, uh, I don't want to call them cliches, but talking points as Rodney Terry used, starting with defense. The story of the 2020. 324 Texas Longhorn should be the fact that they found a way for back-to-back -back games in the NCAA tournament to put forth their finest defensive performances. And unfortunately, the story is going to be when their scores they needed the most, Max Acemich chip. I mean, a guy who's been a March Madness darling his entire career, right? I wrote about it. Average 20 plus in March for his career. Dylan Dazu coming off of last March where he was a scorer averaging almost 17 points a game. That should have been the story of how they finally put it together defensively and found a way <laughs> Chip, to, to, I mean, slow down, connect four points in the first half, one of eight shooting 
And unfortunately, the story is going to be missed opportunities. They could not find whether it was DeSue or Ace Miss and Chip. We talked about it all year. Their um, inability of this team to have a consistent third scorer, a guy who, you know, when Ace Miss and DeSue aren't having their best nights, someone to step up. They didn't get it. You know, Tyrese Hunter didn't have his best. I mean, well, you know what? I, I, he had, he put you this way. I guess if we're comparing Tyrese Hunter nights compared to the regular season, it's about as good as you could have asked for, right? I think he shot 54% for the field. Um, Kendall Weaver had, uh, what, 11 points, I believe. Maybe it was 13, I think 11 in, 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 um, in the second yeah, 13, half. Um, 13. 13 points on three of seven shooting, but six of six from the free throw line. Right. So 13 overall, 11 in the first half. Just didn't get enough. So to your point, yeah. I mean, and I we spoke with Dylan post game. He said, "Yeah, what's frustrating is those are looks I would take all year, and I felt like I hit those shots all year." Rodney Terry said, "Nah, those are the guys who got us here. We're gonna put the ball in their hands each time." Just couldn't knock down shots. So definitely, um, and I think the biggest thing is we probably, you know, I don't know how much further you want to go into the Tennessee game because we're going to transition to what this offseason looks like, but. The feeling that was palpable in that locker room, Chip, was just the sense of finality with this group. You're losing Ace Miss. You're losing Dessou. You're losing Brock. IT Horton's gone. You know, Caden Shedrick announced uh, post game that he is going to return for a sixth year, but uh, this team is going to look completely different. You got Trey Johnson coming in. You got Cam Scott coming in. <laughs> uh, what's going to happen? Six, foot guard? six shooting guards, six foot five shooting guard. What's going to happen Let's with go. the guard? At the guard position, right? You know, Tyrese Hunter, he said, I I've got to get my body right and I've got to see what the future holds for me, whether it's coming back to Texas or going to the NBA draft. You know, you just knew in, in this locker room, Dylan Mitchell as well has a decision to make that this group, it's done, you know, as far as the, this group and, 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 you know, maybe pursuing uh, next year, right? So we'll get into it a little bit and take it or leave it. What do you build around? A lot of questions. You will see what this roster shapes up, but yeah. Uh, Rodney Terry felt chip and he said it that he thought this was a second weekend team. They don't make it to the second weekend. And it's just a tough pill to swallow because finally chip, they were playing the type of defense that Rodney Terry had just implored his group to play all year and hit shots when it mattered. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, um, you know, Dylan Mitchell, I don't know what to make of Dylan Mitchell. I don't know where his game got better this year. I mean, I know he got more minutes. Um, and proportionally his scoring average and rebound average went up. I don't know if it was, I mean, they couldn't, they didn't know what they were getting from Dylan Mitchell from night to night. He didn't have a go-to move. He didn't have a counter move. I thought, I thought he did have one when I saw him hit that turnaround jump shot in the orange white game uh, on the baseline. I was like, Oh, okay. Look at Dylan Mitchell. Um, but he plays 26 minutes against Tennessee. Um, four rebounds, two points. Um, I don't know. I, I will say this, Chip, really quick. Offensively, didn't give you a ton, but he was part of that job, part of the, the duo of face and connect, that he did his job there. But to your point, just your broader point, in terms of the growth offensively, I, I, I'm with you. I just want to at least give him credit there that he and Weaver were part of that duo that shut down. Connect. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I love Kendall Weaver because he just gives you – so much energy and effort and it, it shows up with him driving and getting fouled and hitting six of six free throws. Um, he hit a three pointer in the Tennessee game, finished with 13 points. He's, you know, just a huge energy toughness guy. I thought he and Brock were really instrumental from a toughness standpoint in the win over Colorado state. I think you, 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 it, if you're Rodney Terry, you've got to build up Kendall Weaver, build his confidence. He's got to be on the floor for you. You know, if we're kind of doing comparisons and we're going to transition to the women here, you know, he's Shea Holly. You know, he's just going to give you relentless efforts and defense. And, and if he can just get his shot going the way it was his freshman year at UT Arlington, which I don't, I don't think. I, I I don't see why he won't. I think he'll be a just an incredibly different player next year. Um, and a real weapon. You put him with, you know, Trey Johnson and and Cam Scott, 
you know, those two guys at six, six and six, five as shooting guards. And then, you know, Caden Shedrick is your, your frontline guy. Um, and then you've got to nail it in the portal to, to make sure that you are capable of, you know, contending in the sec. Cause that's the standard at Texas is you need to be contending for your conference championship and you need to be um, right around the top 10 in the country in whatever sport you are. So uh, if that's not happening on the regular, then, you know, we'll have a different conversation, but yeah, I, I do think there is some things to be excited about for next year. Yeah. And I mean, listen, when you get a guy like Trey Johnson coming in, certainly room to, to be excited. Someone you think yeah. is, is a pure score. Yeah. Go for it. Jeff. Yeah. I mean, I, I've my uh, college roommate's son played on that Lake Highlands team with Trey Johnson that won the state championship. And everything I've heard is the guy's a great teammate. He's unbelievable in the locker room. In addition to the five-star talent and the ability to, you know, fill up a stat sheet. So um, really excited about him and Cam Scott. I mean, those guys can both get it done. So let's see what Texas can can do in the portal. I mean, what would your number one priority be in the portal? Point guard. I'm sorry. I I, right. I, I, I agree. I, I think we were kind of talking about this, speculating, um, you know, right before uh, Sark's presser, some of the, the media who cover basketball, that, you know, is there a thought of maybe moving Kendall Weaver over? He played a little bit of point at UTA, but no, I, I, I don't. With what we think the ceiling for next year could be, given the guys we just talked about, right? I, I, I don't think Kendall Weaver. I, I Chip, I am more intrigued with the idea of playing uh, Trey Johnson at the three and Kendall Weaver at the two, and finding a point guard than I am playing Kendall Weaver at the one and and, and Cam, excuse me, uh, and Trey Johnson at the two. Um, yeah, I think I think point guard, and I'll be honest, whether that is, I like the idea of another wing that can stretch the defense and shoot. But I, in terms of a point guard, I am looking at if Cam, um, excuse me, if Trey Johnson is the scorer that we believe he is, and, you know, guys like Caden Shedrick are coming back. Um, I like the idea of a defensive point guard who can facilitate. Um, it isn't necessarily looking for his shot. Max had to be that guy because we know what this team was made of, right? They needed someone to take those shots and score. But you have those guys in place now, right? Like I think there's someone who needs to um, be that facilitator, be that person who's a floor general and can play defense again. Um, I, I, I'm really intrigued, Chip, and I'll pass back to you on this, of the idea of um, two guards, meaning your point guard and Weaver, who can defend the perimeter really well. So I think that's going to yeah. serve the team uh, 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 a great deal. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And that's going to be um, – you know, priority number one, in my opinion, because Max A. Smith should not, he should have been off the ball. You know, he should have been coming off screens and getting not, not in pick easy pick and pop, pick and roll situations where defenders can, you know, blitz that and stuff him. I mean, he's, he needs to be running around coming off screens and he was having to handle the ball you know, too much because Tyrese Hunter was all over the place and he was a turnover machine, even in the Tennessee game, Tyrese Hunter, you know, six turnovers, three of them on inbounds passes. It's like, do you practice your inbounds plays? I mean, yeah, that was tough. All right, let's move on to the Texas women because they did handle business after losing in the round of 32 a year ago. Uh, to Louisville and Haley Van Lith. Um, and they got drummed in that game, if you'll remember. They got they got boat race 71 to 53. Uh, they handled business against Alabama. Alabama had some really quick guards who made it tough on uh Shayla Gonzalez and Shea Holly, but the inside game of Aaliyah Moore, um, Madison Booker getting whatever she wanted in the first half with Kevin Durant watching. Uh, pretty cool. And the just kind of the three-headed monster of 
Texas down low with Taylor Jones, Deanna Gaston, Amina Muhammad, um, which is going to be absolutely necessary. Uh, heading into this Sweet 16 game against Gonzaga, Eric, and this Gonzaga team is 32 and three. And people are going to say, oh, who do they play? Well, their conference is not great, but they did play and beat Stanford in December. Um, they beat the same Alabama team that Texas just beat uh, by 10. And um, they have all seniors. Like they are, and they have twins at the guard position in the Truong twins, uh, Kaylin and Kaylee. And they average, like together, they average more than 10 assists a game. It's, this game scares me. Now, they don't have the size that Texas does, but Yvonne Ejim, who is their leading scorer, she's 6'1". She averages 19.9 and 8.8 rebounds per game. She is relentless, Eric. And if Texas doesn't, you know, Aaliyah Moore is kind of, and Deanna Gaston are kind of the matchups for her. If they don't come in totally locked in, this could be a really rough uh, situation for Texas. I'll piggyback off of what you just said there because my point that I was going to lead into is I think this is a Taylor Jones, Amina Muhammad, Deona Gaston, uh, Aaliyah Moore. Does this game chip, and maybe, you know, um, I'm reaching here, does it remind you a little bit of Kansas State in the sense that it feels like everything kind of runs through their big and Aoka Lee, and of course they've got talent in the guards and whatnot. That's just kind of the feeling I get from this matchup. But no, I mean, listen, you talk about a Gonzaga team, but when you amass that type of record in the regular season, you know you're not going to beat yourself, right? I mean, sure, yes, the competition, not necessarily the best um, in the league, but as you said, they beat Stanford. That's a real deal team, right? So really interested to see kind of, in my mind, I, I think everything runs through the bigs. And we've talked about it on this podcast, you know, uh, Dick Schaefer <laughs> kind of, uh, I don't want to turn into a love-hate relationship because I, I think, you know, I'll say you love all your players, right? But uh, uh, a bit of an up and down relationship with Taylor Jones. I mean, at times, him, you know, wanted to push her to get more, to get more out of her, right? So I, I think her, along with, as you mentioned, Deona Gaston and, and Aaliyah Moore going to be a pivotal matchup there down low. I guess, as I talked about last uh, episode, I have Texas making it to the final four. So I do believe they'll win this game, but in, in some ways, again, it just reminds me of, of the Kansas state game. When you got a big like that down low, of course, uh, Aoka Lee much taller. Um, I think Gonzaga's big, but still a big down low, you know, everything kind of runs through um, th that to me, I think, I think is interesting because you kind of live and die um, in, in a sense Um Almost in a sense, he's like an Iowa State, right? With with uh with um Audie Crooks, right? right? In terms of everything runs through them. So uh definitely be interesting and, to see how things play out. And they rebound like their life depends on it. And those teams scare me because they just are relentless. And the thing about you know Yvonne Jim and um Brianna Maxwell, who's their second leading scorer, they have five players who average double figures, by the way. Um, and they shoot it at a high clip. They shoot the three as well. It's it's a it's a full meal deal with Gonzaga and um, and both Yvonne in the win over Stanford. Both Yvonne, Jim, and Brianna Maxwell each had twenty seven points. Like, and that's going up against Cameron Brink, the All American at Stanford, the six foot four, um, you know, center for for the Cardinal and. This will be this will be a fun matchup. I mean, Texas defensively is going to have to be at its best uh, because I thought they, uh, you know, Vic Schaefer said they didn't have the edge he wanted to see at the beginning of the Drexel game, and and they ended up winning that game by forty. But Alabama kind of shut down Texas's guards. It had to get done inside. Maddie Booker was really good in the first half. She opened six of seven. Um, she, you know, didn't have a outstanding second half, but Aaliyah Moore did. This team finds ways to win. They're going to have to really be locked in all five um, to to get this done because uh, that's a pretty pretty relentless group there. Uh, that game, by the way, is the is uh, the 29th, which is what Friday, and it's at nine at night because they're out in Portland, which is essentially a home game. 
uh, for Gonzaga coming from Spokane. All right, Eric, ready for some love it or leave it? I am ready for some take, take it, it or leave, leave it. it and love it or leave it. Whatever you, Chip, I, I'm, I'm just a guest in your world. Whatever you want to call it, I'm here for it, Chip. You ready for some take it or leave it? <laughs> I'm ready All for right, take let's it do it. Let's do it. We'll do it next right here on the Flagship Podcast with Eric Henry and Chip Brown. All right, and if you're watching us on the uh, Horns 24-7 YouTube channel, we will roll on with some take it or leave it. Eric, Anthony Hill, Anthony Hill Jr. will be Texas' starting middle linebacker in 2024. You taking this or are you leaving this? Chip, I'm taking it, and here's why. Steve Sarkeesian said if the season started today with the caveat that it doesn't start today, Anthony Hill would be the starting middle linebacker. Chip, uh, how many athletes on the face of this planet can do the things that Anthony Hill can do? And to have to unseat that person, that's a tough ask. That's all I'm saying. So that's not to say that maybe, you know, things can't happen between now and fall camp that might make them want to shift elsewhere. But if you're telling me that I got to place my money on someone unseating Anthony Hill, nah, I will take it all day, Chip. What about you? Yeah, I agree. I'm going to take this. There might be some situational things, maybe against power running teams. We'll see what Kendrick Blackshire can do. Um, but against Michigan, Georgia, Kentucky, um, maybe you – have some situational stuff going on in middle linebacker. Although I still love Anthony Hill Jr. being right in the middle of everything, picking up people and throwing them down. So I am taking this. All right. Question number two, back to hoops. Other than Kendall Weaver and Caden Shedrick, who are returning, you're not excited about any other players. Return to the Longhorns next season. Chip Brown, take it or leave it. Yeah, I'm going to take this. I'm not excited about any other players. I mean, if if Tyrese Hunter, who I just went back and looked at his numbers, they're almost identical from his freshman year at Iowa State, which, you know, he's averaging 10, 11 points. Um, but I just didn't see him elevate his game on, on a consistent basis. Uh, this, you got to have three scoring options. He needed to be the third one. Um, Dylan Mitchell. I love Dylan Mitchell. He's a great kid. He means well. I just don't, he gets lost on defense at times. He never really developed an offensive game. So yeah, I'm going to take this now. I am very excited about Trey Johnson and, uh, and Cam Scott, but they're not returning players. So uh, Eric, what say you? Yeah, Chip, uh, I think I'm forced to take it only because we don't particularly know the status of Tyrese Hunter and Dylan Mitchell. And as you said, I mean, Tyrese and Dylan are great guys. I mean, obviously, again, I've seen DM from the time he was, you know, 15 in, in Tampa. And Tyrese Hunter, I mean, you know, uh, certainly. And Tyrese, I got to give him credit just, just from a media perspective. I mean, a guy who, even in his worst moment, you know, stood there, answered the questions, you know, took it like a man. You know, he, he didn't run away from from the question. So you always appreciate that as a media member. Um, but A, you know, don't know their status. And as you kind of talked about with Tyrese, I mean, there was a progression in his game from sophomore year to junior year in terms of shooting percentage, but you just didn't see it on a consistent basis. And the same thing with Dylan Mitchell. You saw uh, more of it, right? You know, in terms of playing almost 30 minutes a game as opposed to the 17 and a half he played as a freshman, but you didn't see that consistency, right? So Kendall Weaver, especially, and, and Kendall didn't want to acknowledge at the time because obviously he was hurt by the loss, but he had a damn good game on the highest stage, right? Um, so that, and Caden Shedrick is someone who, Caden made this point, Chip, hasn't had a full offseason to just work on his game in a while. You know? Right. Bad right, he had the offseason shoulder surgeries. Right, so um, I have to I have to take this as well, Chip. All right. Take it or leave it number three, Eric. The Texas women will be fighting for their lives against 32 and 3 Gonzaga in the Sweet 16. You taking it or leaving it? No, I'm taking it. I mean, I think they're going to win. 
but I don't think it's going to be it, hell. You could say against Alabama, right? I mean, they weren't like fighting for their lives, but they got pushed. And Gonzaga's a better team than the Crimson Tide, and they're heading to Portland. And, and I understand, you know, um, it's certainly nearly a home game for uh, Gonzaga, right? And, and, and listen, Portland's a great city, especially for women's sports, right? You know, I understand why you have a site like that, but it, it's a tough ask, especially in, in this uh, in this environment. So yeah, I think they win. It's not going to be a cakewalk. Yeah, yeah. This game scares me um, because they're they're just so senior laden. You know, they've they got this two headed monster at point guard and and Kay Lynn and Kaylee Truong. And like I said, you look at their box scores, and it's always six or seven assists from each. So. Um, you know, Madison Booker, as good as she is, and she's the Big 12 Player of the Year, it's still new to her. And she's carrying a lot of weight. That's why these the players around her need to step up and make plays like they did in the K-State game at the Big 12 tournament when Shea Holly hits that three with a minute 13 left. Because we talked about it against OU with the Big 12 regular season title on the line. There was Madison Booker trying to do everything herself. She's one of nine in the, you know, shooting in the fourth quarter. And her teammates, who are the veterans, need to be the ones stepping up. Texas cannot afford to get into a situation like that where Madison Booker feels like she has to do everything because that's too much. It's too much to put on her. And uh, and I think Gonzaga is a good enough defensive team that they're going to make life difficult um, for Madison Booker. So it's... It's going to be a great matchup. I'm taking it just like Eric. Um, and thanks, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Flagship Podcast. For Eric Henry, I am Chip Brown. Till next time, we'll see you over at Horns247.com. If you're not an annual member at Horns247, oh, my goodness. You're late to the party, but it's still a great time to join because... We are in spring football, and of course, things are all moving seemingly in the right direction in all of Texas athletics. So make sure that you are uh, joining us over at horns247.com. Uh, for Eric, I'm Chip. Until next time, stay safe and keep the faith.